Hey friends, so in case you're wondering where I was at 3 o'clock, I uh, forgot to change the stream key, so I was streaming onto A Gypsy's Kiss. Thankfully, my business partner, the magical treasure princess, Shelly Shelley Carney, let me know. So, sorry I'm late, but that's why I was late. I don't know if that's a good reason, but... Uh, so, we have an interesting show for you today. I want to start off... So, I have a sample that I collected locally. It's from the Arroyo de las Barrancas in uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And, but I collected it locally so that I could take the opportunity to share pocket field notes with you. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about pocket field notes because I think it's a great application, and I think everybody should be using it for every everything, including uh, collecting sand samples. And then we'll get on to the sample. We can go a little bit longer today because we don't have a four o'clock show. So again, thanks for joining me. I hope you find the show interesting. By the way, it's, it's a heck of a sample. It's very diverse. So I think we'll have a lot of fun with it. Uh, and again, thanks for uh, joining me today. Let's start with the housekeeping. housekeeping you want towels? Of course, you want towels. We're out on the beach, right? Uh, so make sure that before you leave today, you like our video. Uh, YouTube likes it when you like our video. We get extra Benny points from it from us, and they help promote us uh, when you do that. Uh, secondly, if you're not uh, already, uh, if we'd appreciate it if you share the video with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your business associates, the entirety of your social networks, uh, because I think once people find out how interesting sand is, they have a new perspective on. It. And you have to keep in mind that this channel is uh, uh, about sand, but in the context of the, fa uh, of the facts that sand is one of our three most consumed resources behind air and water, and we are using it faster than the... Uh, then the planet can replenish it. And if you'd like to know more about it, uh, I have a playlist on the World uh, Sand Project channel that has several videos. I strongly recommend you look at the video of Vince Beiser's talk at... Um, um, TEDx. Uh, that's in that playlist, and it explains to you in 15 minutes everything uh, that's wrong with sand mining and the effect that it's having on the planet and the effect that it's having on human lives. So that's what we're about. We use sand as a as a way, and the beauty of sand as a way to um, uh, to promote that message. Okay, because that's what we want to do. So uh, finally, if you're not already a subscriber, this would be the ideal time to subscribe. Click on that subscribe button and when you see the notifications bell, ring the notifications bell and that way whenever we start a live stream, you'll be uh, immediately informed and in the know. More about this topic, more about the beauty of sand, more uh, recognition of how unique uh, this resource is in terms, I mean, I'm sure there's beautiful air and I imagine there's beautiful water, uh, but to me, there is no more resource that is more... Uh, beautiful un under microscope uh, than than is sand, and um, and so we're going to take a look at uh, uh, one of those today. But first, I, I, the point that I wanted to make about pocket field notes is what I had used pocket field notes when I went to Las Vegas and uh, collected samples in the Red Rock uh, Canyon National Monument, uh, but. Uh, I did an update to the app and I did it incorrectly, so I lost all my data. So I wanted to get out as soon as possible to collect another sample, even if it meant collecting one that was close to home so that I can show you how this, uh, how this tool works. So I'm going to switch over to uh, the screen now. And uh, I just put up some images and I will give this a bitly address, but I'll put this link uh, in the description box below this video so that you can take a look at these images if you want. I can actually do a video of it, but I thought today, let me just walk through it. So the application can be downloaded from the App Store and uh, either Apple or Google Play. You can also order it from Amazon. It's $1.99. It was developed by a friend of mine whose name is Mike Hempfling. Mike had developed a pocket app for uh, the Forest Fen Treasure Hunter uh, community, and it too is a great app. You can find it under uh, in uh, um, uh, in your. Uh store in your app store by looking up Fen Treasure. It also sells for $1.99. It has a format similar to this, but it's got things like the poem. It enables you to look at uh, look up the definitions of words in the poem, etc. So it's if you're a Fen Treasure hunter, um, it's very good. Now, that shouldn't stop you because what I've discovered about pop pocket field notes is that 
it can be used by anyone doing anything that they want to document. So for example, I'm not going to show that today. I was on, uh, I've, I've been documenting my experiences with my new electric bike and I was out for a ride yesterday or day before. Let's see, what's today? There's yesterday. And so when I finished the ride, I documented the uh, miles, the time, the amount of volt voltage used. I took a picture of the location, and I documented where I was. And it gave me the ability to make notes about that experience. So I'm using it for a lot of other things, but I'm especially using it for collecting my sand samples. Now, at the same time, uh, I believe that a forest fan treasure hunter could use this application to document their boots on the ground. Not None of it is stored in the in the cloud, so the app builder, in this case Mike, doesn't get any of that information. Uh, it can be used by a geologist doing field work. It can be done uh, used by a rock hound to record uh, their collection points, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's just a great field documentation tool, which is why I imagine Mike called it Pocket Field Notes because he saw the potential for all the different uses it has. So consider it for your own use. I will get to. Uh, the chat room as soon as I can because I know uh, you may have some questions on that. Do me the favor because uh, I am alone and there's a lot going on here in front of me. Um, it, it precede your question. If it's just a comment, you don't have to highlight it. But if it's a question, precede it with at sign uh, World Sand Project. And that way I'll see it. It'll highlight it for me and I can see it on the screen here uh, in front of me. So thank you for that. Let me refresh this just to make sure that we're updated there. Dashboard is working, meaning you are seeing it. And as I said, I started, I forgot to change the stream key on OBS, so it st I started streaming to a gypsy's kiss. Uh, but Shelly noticed it and uh, contacted me right away to let me know to switch over. That's why I was a little bit late. So let's go through Pocket Field Notes. This is the main screen. You're going to click on uh, the menu button to go forward. Now, these are just images, so this isn't actually the app. When you get to the menu button, you have a choice of the main menu, which is the screen that we just saw. It goes back to this menu. Menu. Oops, don't want to do that. Sorry. It goes back to this menu. That's the main screen. Or you can go to projects. When you click on projects, uh, this is where your top level folder is. Now, as you can see, I have a folder that I'm not going to bore you with today on my electric XP bike. And uh, Mike because because I asked him to make this about the World Sand Project, he put a World Sand Project folder in there for me. So all my World Sand Project sample collections are in that folder. And when you want to see the folder, you just click on the view. Uh, you can What you can edit is the name. You can call it a different name, or you can delete the folder in its entirety. Or if you'd like to down here, you can add a new project, a new, you know, a new folder for a new project. So let's say you were... Uh, rock hounding northern New Mexico. You can make a project for rock hounding new, uh, or a folder for rock hounding. When you open up the World Sand Project folder, uh, as I said, I had two other samples that I had collected at Red Rock uh, Canyon National Monument, but I lost them in the process of an update, and it was my fault. It wasn't Mike's fault. I, I, I didn't notice that he had, I had asked him to make some changes, and I'll show you one of them in just a minute. And he updated it, and he sent me an email saying he updated it, and I ignored all of that and uh, deleted the app and re-downloaded re it, and in the process deleted my data. So I wanted to create a new one. Same thing here. I can view it. I can edit the name. In this case, I make the name, the date of the collection and the sample number for that date. Or I can delete it down here. If I go, if I click on menu, I go back one, or I can add a new note. So there are notes within folders, okay? And you can make an infinite number of both folders and notes depending on uh, what you're doing with them. So in this case, I made a project note and the minute, so the second actually, you click on, so you make this, uh, you make this project note and you click on view, you get this window. The moment you click on view, it collects all this data automatically. The latitude, longitude, the elevation, the date, and that was the, uh, that was what I asked Mike to change. He had it in a month, day, year format, and uh, field people use the year, month, day format. So he changed that. He did that overnight. And the sample collection time. So you can see that I collected this on Monday, uh, March 2nd at 426 in the afternoon. And of course, it's using the phone's location uh, to do that. 
Uh, so editing enables me to add a description, and I have added a description since then, but uh, it says no description. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't collect the page, I guess I should have, that has the description on it, but that's what editing enables me to do. Then I can start adding pictures. So if I wanted to add information about the note, I would edit the note, but then I can start adding pictures. And the first picture that I always take as a sample is I have a, a, I have a uh, lens, a microscope microscopic lens that fits over the camera on my iPhone and I take a picture of the sample. So if I don't have any other pictures, don't get to make any other pictures, I have at least that one. But I can add as many pics as I want, as many photographs as I want by just clicking on that button. When you take the photograph, it asks you if you want to save it or not. Uh, and then if you want to save it, it comes back to this uh, page. I can delete this note um, uh, in either way, but I can also click on this icon right here, and that takes me to the view map. Uh, and so, based on the latitude and the longitude that it already collected um, uh, in that by making the note, it uh, it uh, connects me to the map application. And you can see here, I can go back to field notes. Uh, I can document, it records the location, but I don't have to because it already did it and it has that map button. And, uh, and you know, uh, I, I suggested to Mike this would be a great tool for field guys if we could do it this way. And uh, his reaction was, okay, and then he did it. And uh, as you can see, what's funny about this is this area here, it's along the Rio Grande River here. This is called Trailhead Beach. A lot of people go, so there's a parking area down here. We're going to see it in just a minute. Oops, sorry. I didn't turn off my phone. Excuse me. Uh, so we're going to see this later. But what I thought was funny is that... Uh, that the map spells it wrong. There are actually two R's in Barranca. And a Barranca can be interpreted in two ways. Either uh, if you're in a Barranca, you're in a canyon. If you're above the Barranca, you're on a hillside or a mountainside, right, looking down into the canyon. Uh, and that's where I collected the sample. As you can see, it's fed by a, an, a big arroyo. It's called the Arroyo de la Barranca, the Arroyo de la Hillside. You can't see it here, but this is a big... Uh, mesa looking hill and uh, there's a lot of activity here so a lot of the sand that flows into this area comes right off this hill right uh, although it's sourced along this arroyo as well and I think that's what makes it the combination of the two makes it interesting but there's no basalt uh, from it that comes from the Rio Grande because it hasn't reached the Rio Grande so it's slightly different uh, from uh, the Rio Grande River and, and this is traditional New Mexico landscape you know, high, dry deserts. So, uh, what the heck? Hold on. So, second time they call. I hope it's not an emergency. I don't know who the person is. Uh, so... Uh, so then you can go back. All right, so we just used the view map, but here's the cool thing. You can email that to anyone you want. Now, again, since I'm in the World Sand Project folder, Mike automatically, when you click on email, uh, if you're in the World Sand Project folder, it automatically populates the address to worldsandproject at gmail.com, and it takes all this data that it already collected, along with the photographs, uh, including a link to view it on the map. So when you get it on in email, you can save yourself the trouble. And uh, it collects all these pictures. So I took about 10 or 11 pictures here. Some of them I deleted, but it adds it to that. But I wanted to show you when it comes into your email, it looks like this. So from Toby Michael Eunice to me, World Sand Project, it sends you all that data. If I click here, I can see the exact location on a map. And we're going to use that in, in just a minute, right? So that's where we were. And then it also sends all the photos. So there was a couple of photos that didn't render. Uh, and it, it gives you a choice of sending them in full size, which was 150 megabytes worth of photos last night uh, from my phone. Or it gives you the option of uh, progressively, you know, 
uh, large, medium, and small. Uh, the small ones are very, very small. And, and if you're going to use them on a screen like I did today, but it saves you all the effort. You can hit email. If you're not in an area where you have service, it waits until you're in an area, and then it emails it to you. So it, it is literally one of the coolest apps uh, I've ever used uh, for the kind of work that I do. And I can think, you know, I go trout fishing. I go uh, treasure hunting. I go rock hounding. I go, uh, there's lots of things that I do in the outdoors. I go, you know, sand collecting. I, lots of things I do in the outdoors, uh, riding a bicycle. So now I have one tool that enables me to collect all the important data about each of those things that I do in separate folders and to do it consistently and have them all there at, uh, at once. And then when I need to email that file, that, uh, that uh, project uh, to myself so I have it on here and that way I can do and I, I did exactly that so when I built the uh, photo album today oops let me go back I need to go back to the main part I'm going to go back so I will post this uh, I will share this link to the pocket field notes pages although for a buck 99 download it and it's real easy to learn real easy to use even if you're kind of fumble fingered like uh, me when it comes to typing on uh, typing uh, stuff on uh, your cell phone so let's go to our photos and uh, this link is also in the description box below it's the Arroyo de la Barranca and I kept the spelling that was on the map that's probably wrong uh, above the Rio Grande River Rio Rancho New Mexico Rio Rancho is uh, south of me uh, you'll see when I open up the maps it says it's about eight minutes away from where I live which is about right so what we're looking at is we didn't have to travel far in this case. Usually I have an arrow pointing from where I am to wherever we're going. This is where I am, right? This is, uh, I live very near where I collected the sample. And I guess the point that I want to make is you don't have to travel very far to collect a sand sample. You don't even have to be near water. If you're in the Midwest or the West, there are plenty of dry riverbeds that you can collect a beautiful sample from because those dry riverbeds contain sand that were, was the result of weathering and mass wasting that occurred at the mountains above it. So anytime, anytime you're near a river, you can collect the sand. Now, if you can collect a dry sample, that's good. If it's a wet sample, that's okay too. I'll just uh, dry it out in the oven. I've gotten a couple of wet samples. Our friend, um, our friend uh, Violet Mercury sent a sample from her, the lake uh, uh, near her house, and it came wet. So I had to uh, put it in the oven and dry it uh, at uh, low temperature for a couple of hours, and there have been a couple of others. Uh, but I don't mind that. If they've, it has to be wet for you to c uh, collect the sample, just make sure you put it in a plastic bag that's not going to leak uh, when the Postal Service uh, uh, takes it, and uh, and then I'll worry about drying it when I get home. It doesn't hurt the sample uh, at all. It's something that people who do this for uh, for a living, geologists who study sand for a living, do exactly the same thing. So here we are between Santa Fe and uh, Albuquerque. You can't. Oh, they didn't. That's interesting. They do it. Oh, they're just putting the capitals in. So Santa Fe and Albuquerque in. Uh, Rio Rancho. And I said Rio Rancho is a little bit south of me. Uh, my partner, my business partner, Shelly Carney, lives in Rio Rancho. Uh, you can actually see that that little blue mark is my where I live. <clears throat> so I was collecting down here. And, and remember, we're collecting in an area that is still in the Rio Grande Rift uh, here above uh, uh, where Albuquerque and the Rio Grande uh, uh, rolls, I guess is the best way to describe it. This side of the rift was uh, was the result of a lot of volcanic action, volcanic activity, and you can still see volcanoes. There's a set of volcanoes that are in the West Mesa above Albuquerque, and they're called the uh, five, five Albuquerque volcanoes. But this whole stretch of the Rio Grande Rift in New Mexico is very volcanic. This, on the other hand, the, the east side, was the result of tectonic activity. So the sand that's processed from this area is completely different from the sand that's processed uh, in this area. The, and, and I keep wanting to go in this area. There's a couple of uh, arroyos, and I'll, as I get closer down in this area, the problem is uh, that happens to be Sandia Pueblo land, 
and uh, it's fenced, and they don't like you messing around with this stuff, even though it's uh, sand. So this is the area I showed you before, uh, the Arroyo de la Barranca along the Rio Grande. Uh, this is the dry riverbed that feeds the location that I get from sand. But I'll show you pictures of this, and you'll see a lot of areas along this uh, plateau, this mesa, uh, where uh, there's washout. And so it ends up in the same location. So it was very gravelly, you'll see. Here are the pictures that, I, these are the photographs that I collected using uh, project uh, or uh, pocket field notes. <clears throat> and then I, uh, I, uh, I sent that email, they were attached to the email, and I just downloaded them and put them in my uh, Gmail photos account, the uh, Google photos account. So this is the exact sample location. I, I ended up sorting the sample and you're gonna see it in just a minute, I, I made, um, I sorted it into three levels, kind of a uh, medium, uh, 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 medium coarse, uh, fine, and extra fine samples. Uh, but it's interesting to look at all three, and we'll do that uh, under the under the microscope so that you can see the differences between all three. And I'll do it without changing uh, the magnification, so you can see it. All right. So this was the area, and you can see. Uh, this would be a rock hound's dream because there's all kinds of rocks. They look gray in this picture, but there's all kinds of colors and all kinds of uh, 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 variability in them. I picked up several myself. I, I, you know, for example, I picked up a basaltic rock, which technically shouldn't be here. That looks to me more basaltic than anything. And then there, there were these con conglomerates, which are just big rocks made of small rocks and some form of uh, sedimentary uh, cement. So um, this was the area right below the arroyo. You can see here's the mark of the arroyo. You can see this limestone layer right here, which would be interesting to dig into because generally limestone, you, you can uh, generally find fossils because limestone comes as a result of fossils being buried underwater. You got to remember this part of New Mexico at one time around uh, 600 to 800 million years ago was the bottom of an ocean. So you'll see a lot of that here. I didn't find any fossils in this sample, but I didn't look for them in that area. Had I wanted to find them, I might have poked around in that, uh, that layer right there. So uh, very New Mexico, and of course we're in the middle of winter, so everything's very dry. There's, it's not very green. Um, and uh, classic, classic Arroyo photos, that's me with, my son uh, with the sun to my back uh, taking that final picture. And I just kind of spun around, right? I'm basically standing at the location where I collected the sample and uh, and took these pictures kind of, I guess I could have done a, well, no, you don't have the option of a photograph. You have to pretty much spin around to take the pictures. Now, as I was walking back to my car, I walked over uh, not the top of the mesa, uh, but the side of the mesa. There was a path. There was a, a, a developed path, dirt path, uh, that either Rio Rancho or Bernalillo had uh, done. I didn't know who, but I found these. And there were a couple of these locations where water had obviously run over, uh, collected some of this material and uh, pushed it down into the uh, arroyo. So that's where, where uh, it came from. And again, you can see a couple of different layers here, the red sand, which means it's sedimentary, oxidized, uh, the white sand, uh, also sedimentary, uh, but if you poked at that a little bit, you'd probably find some fossils, uh, some miniature, at least some miniature fossils uh, in there. And this is one of those areas that is not, um, it's not parkland. Uh, it's what they call the open area. So although uh, they would probably get excited if you started, you know, if you brought in an excavator, if uh, you're digging away with your geology hammer, I don't think they'd get, um, they'd get real excited. This is the view from, not from the top of the mesa, uh, but from the path that I was on the, near the top of the mesa, uh, looking out into the Rio Grande and then across to the, uh, across the Rio Grande. Basically, I'm on one side of the rift and that's the other side of the rift. Those are what we call the San, Sandia Mountains. Sandia is the, Sandia is the Spanish word for water and the reason they called it the, the Hispanics, uh, there's there's a uh, interesting little uh, stop. I don't know how to describe it. One of those sign stops that has says uh, historical, you know, view, uh, and it's between my house. Uh, in Bernalillo and Shelley's house in Rio Rancho, and it's nothing. There's just like a little 
you know, turn off. There's one of those signs. And basically the sign explains this is where the Spanish had come over the mountain. And this was the point at which they had their first view of the Rio Grande and the Sandias and this part of New Mexico. Prior to that time, uh, the population of this area was Native American, was the uh, ancient uh, Indians. And, and I think that was around 1598. Uh, and it was by Coronado, the um, explorer whose name was Coronado. And not far from me is the Coronado State Park, uh, which is, uh, was one of the first places uh, where they were uh, located as they were traveling from east to west. They came up uh, the east side of the, uh, I'm sorry, the west side of the rift and then uh, came over the mountainside, and this was the view that they had. The reason they called them the Sandia Mountains is because in the afternoon we're so low, uh, I, I mean, we're so level. Uh, in the afternoon when the sun sets, it uh, the uh, atmosphere uh, turns the light a reddish color, and that reddish color is... Uh, is uh, projected onto the mountains. So it looks red like a watermelon. So they called them the Sandia Mountains. That's the uh, river. This beach here, they call it a beach, uh, as you saw in the picture, is a popular uh, photography spot. Uh, these, these two young women, it looked like they were just taking selfies of each, you know, pictures of each other. But I've come out here before and there'll be uh, uh, young men and women in their wedding outfits having their photographs taken back there. And again, we're in the middle of winter, so it's not a real pretty place. I mean, although to me it always looks pretty because I love the desert. But uh, but in the, in the spring, summer, uh, and especially the fall, all those cottonwoods and other uh, trees that they have back there turn color. And uh, it just gets beautifully with all those uh, autumn uh, colors. Uh, so it's a great place for people to come out and take uh take their family pictures. I've seen, I've seen, you know, professional photographers with family members uh, taking their, you know, their family portrait, a lot of wedding portraits. And that's not unusual along the Rio Grande. I mean, as I ride my bike along the Bosca Trail on uh, weekends, especially, like I said, during spring and fall, uh, they're always taking pictures uh, around that for that, those environmental shots. Beautiful area. Uh, you've got to like the desert. So this was the uh, version of the, this This is the uh, image I took of the sand immediately after collecting it using that uh, microscopic of attachment, my little plastic. Do I have it? Mm, yeah, I have it here. So let me show it to you. So they stopped making these, unfortunately, because it's really good at what it does. Let me, I'm going to bring you back to full frame. So that's what I use. It's a microscopic lens that just clips over the back of your camera, over the lens, and basically you have uh, not, I mean, it isn't, it isn't, you know, laboratory class microscope, but it gets you a good microscopic, uh, a macroscopic picture, I guess is what I'd call it. So that's what I used for the first picture, and I was still in... Uh, pocket field notes when I did that. And then uh, this is after I got uh, the sand back to my place uh, and I started processing it because I do go through a process and I compare it and I got what I got or the differences. This is coarse sand, medium sand, and fine sand. And that's because I have uh, sieves that enable me to strain it by various sizes. So the sieves, the screens and the sieves have these sizes. And uh, once you get down here, you're getting into the silty area. And then I can compare it to well-rounded, sub-rounded, sub-angular, or angular. In this case, I would call it sub-rounded. There is still uh, a little bit of angle to it, but that's because it's just come off uh, the mountains, right? It hasn't made it all the way. By the time this stuff gets down to the sea, or in this our case, the Gulf of Mexico, it'll be nicely rounded when it ends up on that beach in Galveston. Uh, sample of the project, it's uh, what I would call a light tan generally. Uh, which is not unusual for arroyos uh, around this area. It did have a very high level of magnetite. So uh, I, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember the sample. Oh, the sample from Iceland that we did on Wednesday. You remember I told you that it was so magnetic that it formed a little hemisphere on top of my magnet. This did the same thing, but of course it wasn't just that black basalt. So there's a lot of iron and magnetite in this, and you'll see some of it in the uh, sample. So it cre uh, the, the magnet picked up quite a bit of uh, material when I ran it, when I, 
I basically I brush it through the sample and then give it a tap because sometimes the rocks, some of the rocks that aren't magnetic will just get kind of caught up uh, because of the angularity of them. Uh, so I tap them off and reduce it down to the stuff that's really magnetic. And you can see it's a nice little pile. I think what I'm going to have to start doing is see if I could get a side shot of this so you can see how hemispherical uh, and built up this uh, sample is. So that's the first view. That's what I like to call the wide angle view of the main sample. And as I said, I'm going to show you three, uh, uh, three different as I, as I uh, sieved it, as I uh, sorted it is what it's called, uh, sorted it through the three different layers and got progressively smaller. This is the one uh, that's the main sample, and this is the wide-angle view. And then I just kind of started playing around to see what I could find. And the first thing I found were these round, uh, little round objects. And those, generally speaking, are not quartz. When they're round like that, they tend to be gemstones. Uh, if they're yellow in color or going yellow in color, they're probably citrine. But you see these little round things. They tend to be the gemmy stuff, garnets and sapphires and... Um, and um, citrines. The citrines are actually quart, quartz, but you can see they're already very rounded. They came out round. Uh, and I think that's a, ca that's a, uh, a feature that's uh, found by gemstones. Here are a couple of conglomerates. Now remember, we're dealing with sand grain sizes. I, I um, posted this to um, the uh, geology Reddit group, and a woman responded, now all I need, I'm going to show you the photo that she responded to that I posted on Reddit. Uh, well, let me get to that point. You'll see what, what she said was uh, kind of funny. So see this, unfortunately, this was out of focus. When you get just quartz, it's angular. It's got that conchoidal fracture to it. This is quartz. This is quartzite. These are the various stones with minerals in them that haven't broken down. But when they're round like this, there's something else going on. That tends to be gemmy in nature. And then, of course, there's always the odd-shaped uh, quartz uh, going with it. But here, you see the angular quartz uh, kind of you know, tied in with some of these objects that tend to be a little bit more round. Uh, quartz does that. It doesn't do that. So there's probably some... You know, like I said, garnets, sapphires. I did find one in the sample. So I think, let me go through it. Okay, so this is not the one. Uh, I was thinking about posting this one because this was literally the clearest, most translucent uh, fine quartz I had ever seen. But you can see, you know, just around it, a lot of these other little colored objects that are already rounded off. Quartz looks like this. And and it, and because it's a bow scale seven, it tends to you know that'll be a little bit more rounded, but it never rounds up into a ball like that. So I I feel like those are gemstones. I'm just not enough of an expert to tell you what gemstones they are. Yeah, and again, here's another example. To me, that's a gemstone. This and this and this are quartz because they maintained it anyway. I post this was the picture I posted. This is the cover of uh, this album. It's also the uh, thumbnail on the video. Uh, and I posted it to the Reddit, uh, Facebook uh, International Sand Collector Society, and I posted to both re Reddit Geology and Reddit Rock Hounding. And a woman, and she said she was a woman, in the uh, Reddit Geology group said, it looks like a beautiful little diamond. Now all I need is a beautiful little ring to set it in. And of course, she realized we're talking about objects that are smaller than two millimeters. Very, very small. So guys... Uh, This is the third time these people have called. Hello. Hello. Yes. Wow. Sorry, guys. That was absolutely a... Had the gall to call back three times in less than an hour. Let me block this guy. <sighs> and he's calling back again. Sorry. God, I can't believe anybody thinks it's that important. Oh, he's still going. Jeez. All right. <sighs> okay, uh, robocalls. Well, it wasn't a robocall, it was a person, actually. So uh, that was it. Now, these next three 
uh, the next three images are the um, the sorted sand. So from the co most coarse to the most fine at the same level of magnification. So that was the most coarse, and then the medium fine, and then the very fine. And uh, I would say I could let me let me go back and do them again. Right. So they're all taken at the same. Uh, level of magnification. I just literally slid them from one side to the other. We're going to do that again today. So most coarse to medium coarse or medium fine, depending to very fine. And as you can see, the uh, what I was going to say, as you can see, they're dominated by uh, by the quartz and some of those rounded gemstones. So a lot of a lot of rounded material in here. I'm I'm not going to say it's gemstones because I'm not um, as much of a a, a, a enough of a geology uh, know enough about geology to claim that it's uh, gemstones, but they sure look like gemstones to me. Okay, uh, so let's go on to the maps real quickly, and here we are. And I just pulled that up from uh, from my pocket field notes. I'm going to zoom out. We'll zoom back in here in just a second. So again, right down the middle of the Rio Grande Rift, this side is all volcanic. This side is all tectonic. Uh, but it formed this rift uh, 250 million years ago, and it's what's called uh, a, a an aborted rift. That means it started to be a rift. It could have separated, had it continued and gone both north and south, it could have separated the western states uh, right in half at New Mexico, and they could have been a different continent. Uh, but it just didn't work out that way. So the map itself, uh, the map, I, I'm sorry, the, the location itself, here's our Arroyo de la Barranca. Here's the trailhead beach where we I talked about all that activity. And then if I were to take a picture west, we'd start seeing that. Now, last night, I did lift the little guy. Once I got into 3D, I lift the little guy, and there were some pictures right here in the Arroyo that somebody had taken. Um, and as you can see, this is from the Arroyo as it leads down. It's greener now. It's probably summertime. So there's uh, it's greener. But that's the pretty much the location that I was near. Now, this is the big Arroyo. I actually went up this smaller of the two arroyos to get the sample because it was closer. That's the mesa behind the tree. You can't see it. Um, but uh, but I went up the uh, smaller of the two arroyos. This was taken by Hector Cano. So I don't know Hector. Let me see. I thought he had another one kind of in the middle of the river. Hold on. Let me see if I can pull that one up again. Yeah, right there. So this is the Rio Grande. Uh, at this time of the year, the Rio Grande is running low and very brown by the time it gets down here uh, because uh, the Rio Grande is the major source of uh, agricultural water, you know, water used for agriculture. So it looks like he's actually standing in the river here. Uh, uh, but that gives you a scene. So that's the trailhead beach. That's the small mesa that I was talking about. And our, and our you can't see the uh, arroyo comes out over here. But behind the trees, you can see the Sandia Mountains. So uh, a nice area. I, there's a lot of people there. It's one of the, during the summer months, it is one of the areas where there is uh, recreation. Let me get my um, my north-south uh, back here. Again, that's where I collected the sample. If we go up this way just a little bit, we're in... Uh, Rio Rancho and Shelly lives down this direction. I live up uh, that direction. So, uh, but this is referred to as the Bosca Trail, and there's a lot of activity uh, at this point. The trail is not paved, uh, but I've ridden it on my bike. It's actually a very nice ride. Uh, and then when I get down to Alameda, it's more paved. But all along here, you'll see these arroyos that come in. This is that arroyo that I showed you a couple of weeks ago that leads to. The, the sand mining section. So that that's a royal sand that has come down from the mountains. It collects right here. And although you can't see it, oh, is that one right there? So you can't see it. Uh, they have a rock retaining wall in here. And there's a truck right there. They collect this sand. And uh, the uh, city of Rio Rancho sells it to construction firms uh, so that they can use it for construction because it's perfect for construction. It's that... Arroyo sand that's still very angular. 
uh, it's sorted, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think the city does it itself. They have a contractor that does that. So let's go look at the uh, sample real quick. I'm going to close this window. Uh, and that's a first look. Now, this is the, uh, the light on the, um, on the microscope has a tendency to make it yellow. And what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to center my stage here so I can get in the right place. And so that's the most coarse sand. But as you can see, it's got a, it's, it's what I call sub-rounded, right? It's been beat up a little bit by the water and the other uh, members of whatever that community is. So it's got a little bit of roundness to it, but some angularity to it. So let me show you the two. I'm going to do this just once so I can show you the two uh, other sizes and you can compare them. And I'll do it just by rolling it forward on the stage. So we're going to go to coarse, from coarse to medium, and you can see the difference there. Oops, one of me is crooked here. You can see the difference between the very coarse and the medium. And then as I, as I sorted it, oops, it doesn't go that far. That's the medium to the very fine, to the fine sand. But they all came from the same sample, and you can see they're pretty much alike. The only difference is uh, in the relative sizes uh, of each. So going from fine uh, back to coarse, all right? And the coarse is still smaller than uh, the two millimeter definition of uh, sand. The others are finer, but in the uh, but it within the range of how sand is defined before it gets to uh, silt and clay. Uh, so let's zoom in, take a quick look at it. Now I'm going to try and do this. It was it had a lot of activity under the uh, under the uh, polarizing microscope, but uh, I'm going to have to unplug and plug. So here it is, kind of close up. And again, uh, I want to find one of those more rounded ones. So those right there, see that, that, that triplet set right there? That, to me, doesn't look like quartz. It doesn't look like it breaks like quartz. It doesn't like it fractures like quartz. And it's too rounded for quartz. Quartz kind of retains because it is a hard material. Let's see if we can find something that looks like quartz because there was a lot of, there's one. So quartz retains its angles, right? It stays angular like that. It, it, it's got the conchoidal fracture. It breaks funny. There's no, uh, there's no evenness to its fracture. It just breaks off where it feels like it, and it just leaves more angles than uh, the other stones. Now, none of those stones that we've seen, none of those gemstone quality things that we've seen are enough to you know, make anything because they're not purely translucent. But, and, and they're the size of a sand grain, but you can see how different they are from uh, the other pieces of quartz. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so we can look around first, see if we can find anything interesting. But a lot of color and a lot of translucent material, a lot of see-through material. But see the difference between a piece of quartz there that has all that clarity in it and all the other things that are kind of, they're, they're uh, translucent, but they're, you know, they've got more opaqueness to them. There is the only piece, I think that's the only piece of basalt that I found the sample. So it snuck in there uh, somehow. There's no explaining it. And then there was a lot of the uh, conglomerates, that is mixtures of other minerals. That blue piece that you see there uh, is a conglomerate. And, um, and that white one right there, let me get closer in so you can see what, what it represents. And I'm going to zoom in on that so you know what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say uh, conglomerate. Let me zoom into it. Now, if you ever want to do this, I'm going to strongly recommend that you invest in a stereo microscope because, uh, as I've said uh, before, seeing them on this screen as a, as a non, because I have to convert it into non-stereo in order to play it on the screen. Otherwise, the camera doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, but when you see these in stereo, uh, they're just amazing. It, you can... You, you know, I, we had friends over visiting this last uh, Saturday, and um, 
and uh, Sarah wanted to see our studio. And so I took one of the samples and I put it under the microscope and she just kept ooing and eyeing. And, and she said, how do you not just spend hours in here looking at these? And I had to admit to her, I do spend hours in here looking at these. So this is that conglomerate. Now you will, f this is literally a sand grain sized rock. Uh, but you will find, if you're a rock hound, you will find things that are called conglomerates. Uh, they're just like this. They, they're made up of uh, rocks. Uh, they're rocks that have other smaller rocks and minerals in them, and they're cemented together with uh, some probably uh, sedimentary solution and probably a very fine form of sand that, uh, that turns into this cement. So a uh, lot of activity in here, a lot of color, a lot of diversity, but I would say uh, dominated by uh, quartz. Uh, Mark, if you're referring to the microscope, uh, the stereo microscope, uh, it really depends on the quality. You can get a reasonable stereo microscope for the three to four hundred dollar range. Uh, the one that I'm using, go to Amscope, Amscope.com, A-M-S-C-O-P-E.com. They're the largest vendors of a variety of microscopes, and then uh, search for stereo microscopes, and then. Uh, and then sort them by price. And what you find is that the price goes up depending on the number of features. So this is what's, re so you can get a, 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 the stereo microscope will be a binocular. I wish I could show this to you on the camera. Can I move it or I can't? Uh, will be binocular because that's the point of the stereo. So it has two objective lenses instead of just one of the objective lenses that you'll see on a regular laboratory microscope. This is a trinocular because it also has an extra viewing port for the camera. So the more features you add, you can see I'm going to turn the camera slightly and you'll see uh, how it impacts, right? But what the camera sees is a non-stereo view, a monocular view. What I see through the binocular lenses is I see that stereo view that has depth and color and stuff that you don't see in uh, in this image, but it'll give you a good idea. This particular model, uh, if you wait for their sales, they they generally have sales every two, maybe three months, and uh, you can get up to a 15, I've seen as high as 15% discount. Uh, so on a 15% discount, this one cost me about 650 bucks. The camera cost me about a 150, you know, so, but you don't have to spend that much. I'm, I had to do this. I was planning to make a show out of this, so I put a little extra money into it. But the other thing about the stereo microscopes that, that is good for me uh, is they're very easy to view with. Uh, I, I have astigmatism, so I have to take off my glasses. I can't use a telescope. Uh, I, I could never, I had to quit an astronomy class in college because I, I see stars because of the astigmatism. Uh, with these, with the stereo microscopes, you get this beautiful view. And if you ever, for any reason, come to my house, I'll, of course, share the view with you. I can't get that picture. I can't create that image using what I have here. Um, but if you, you know, uh, I would say if you're spending around $500, you're probably getting a stereo microscope that's usable. The other thing that you have to remember, a stereo microscope doesn't have the up-close, intimate look that uh, laboratory microscopes, uh, similar to my polarizing microscope, has. Uh, so, um, But the stereo microscope can be... I've used it for not only th these. I've used it for uh, when I'm rock hounding and I want analysis of a rock. I put it under the stereo microscope. It's great for looking at gemstones. Uh, and it's great for looking at, you know, when somebody says... Uh, somebody told somebody. One of our member vault members said, "I think I see Air Force in the picture on page 99. It's upside down." So I put it under the stereo microscope, and you put it under the stereo microscope, and and display it to you, the monitor like you're seeing now, and you can see it's not Air Force. It's just a bunch of upside down lines, and no matter how you turn it, you can't make Air Force out of it. So uh, I've used it in a variety of ways. It's just, but my favorite way uh, is to use it while uh, looking at sand. So uh, great sample. I was really excited for it and uh, a lot of good color and uh, diversity. And like I said, it's eight minutes away from where I live. 
you know, it's not like I had to travel hundreds of miles like I did for uh, when I went to uh, Las Vegas. I, I basically drove down the street, turned into the parking lot for the uh, open space area and walked around the side of this plateau to the Arroyo. And I could see the Arroyo uh, on the Google uh, Maps. So I knew where I was going and um, it was just an easy walk. And then, and then I went to the other side and there's a trail, the Bosca Trail continues through a cottonwood forest. And I just did my daily walk through there, got my steps in. So, uh, so the point that I'm trying to make is it doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, it's not necessary uh, to travel any place. You don't have to go to a beach or you don't have to wait until the next time you travel. Go look. There, there's sand in your community somewhere, and I don't care whether you live in the mountains or whether you live in the plateau or the plains or the south, the west, the north, the east, there's going to be sand. I mean, we, we have a sample of sand from the New Jersey Pinelands that's one of the most interesting samples that we've seen. It's almost looking, looking at, look, like looking at sugar. So you don't have to be, I, I have one sample of sand that somebody uh, collected at the, on the roadside in, in near Muleshoe, Texas. So there's sand everywhere. So if you collect a sample, we've made a video on how to do it. You've seen the pocket field notes that you can collect all the data for us and send it to us. But uh, go out, have yourself a kind of cool day, and then uh, with your family, you know, and tell them what you're doing and that you're going to send it to us. And then have your family watch the video of the uh, of the sand sample that you sent us. It's kind of cool. Um, I told you that uh, one of our viewers, Brian Gates, um, opted in for the uh, pendant when we showed his sample and uh, he he gave it to his wife and uh, one evening later uh, in the week they went to um, they went to dinner with I think his brother and sister-in-law it could have been her brother and sister-in-law his brother and sister-in-law and the pendant was the talk at the table like how cool is that that was their visit to Cozumel so it, it stimulated a lot of conversation and then he took out his phone and he started showing him the pictures that we were showing on the um, in the uh, photo album so it was just a really kind of wholesome event that they were having with their family members so take your family out collect a sample of sand and um and uh, have enjoyed with your family and friends. So I'm going to go back to now. I've, I've been futzing around, for lack of a better way, with the uh, with a polarizing microscope, and I've had good days with it and bad. And I still can't figure out which are the good uh, or what causes the good and what causes the bad. So let me uh, let me change devices here. And uh, let's see what we can, if we can see anything with a polarizing microscope, because I did see some stuff last night. I've got to hook up with it now, and then I'll switch over. Let's see what it's picking up. Oh, it's picking up something. All right, so I'm going to switch back over to uh, the window shot. And so I've got it underneath the um, 5X objective lens let's zoom in is this what it's going to take let's see what we can see oops that's zooming out way to go tub okay so this is this is what I've, I've been talking about this this software that i use uh, is designed to go along. It's designed for these teles for these microscopes. The problem is it has very little in the way of control of like white balance and things like that. I can change the hue, but that doesn't help me any. Right? That really I can't get to uh, what what is effectively a white balance. So let me just try a couple of things here. See if I can get this. Um, let's get this. Gamma, uh, because when I look at it through the uh, lenses, I can see. Let's see what happens here. Ah, there we go. Let me try this. It's still kind of off color, but is there a blue over here? It's more. Yeah. That's too bad. So let me just uh, let me just play with it a little bit and see if I can because there was uh, 
a refraction that was coming from it. Hmm. Yeah, and now I can see it in the lens, but I can't see it in the camera. Let me tr try something else. So there is another microscopist. He's a, actually a, a German teacher. He teaches science in a, in a high school in Germany. And he always talks about the different things. So let me go back here for just a second. Uh, and what one of the things he suggested for sand... Um, he actually uh, he actually does two videos. One is where he looks at different material, and one is where he talks about microscopy in general. So he recommended that I take a slide, and then I coat the slide with clear nail polish, and then I sp spill the sand on it, wait for it to dry, and then just shake off. So I made one of those for the sample, and one of the interesting things is because it's on a slide, I can either, I can do it one way or the other. That is, I can put the polarizing light right, uh, right down on it, or we can look through it. Oh, it really does make a difference. Okay, so hang on. I'm gonna get you back to the window shot. And let's see if we can adjust that color just a little bit to get a better hue there. Yeah, that's not gonna help. Okay, so. This sand is not green, but that gives us the most uh, refraction, uh, sample of refraction. Let me go back to the device settings, and if, I hope I'm not uh, boring you at this point, but... Um, okay, let's see. I want this one right here. Enable HDR and then bring back gamma, or go up gamma, or go. Yeah, that's not helping me, is it? Okay, so I wish I could do this better for you, but you can see some of the refraction in the quartz. And, and now my first reaction was when I saw it, those are rocks that are refracting back the polarized light, right? Uh, so I thought they were, they were uh, opaque, they looked opaque to me as I was looking at them through um, through the scope. Let me make sure that's all the way up. But then I did this. So I can, with using the polarizing microscope, I can either use the polarizing light as it goes. Uh, so the sample is here, and the light comes from the literally the objective lens, and it reflects back into the lens. Or I can use it in the traditional way. I've got a light below the sample, and I can use that light. So I'm going to switch it over. I'm going to suggest you close your eyes because I don't know how bright this is going to be. So close your eyes. One, two, three. There. Okay. So it should settle down. The point that I'm trying to make is even though the rocks look like they're opaque, you can see that the majority of them are not opaque. They're translucent. Uh, and so, um, let's see if we can... So even though, they, even though they look opaque uh, on the polarizing lens, I'm gonna switch back now. Yeah, see they look opaque. That, that one right there looks like it's an opaque rock and it's reflecting back the surface. It is not, it, and I'll show you, I'll do that for right there. So you can see it's translucent, it's a piece of quartz. Let's focus in on it a little bit. Right there. So when I back, go back to the polarizing lens, it, we get that polarized, uh, polarizing effect. Is there any improvement there? We can brighten it up a little bit. So I, I like this idea of kind of, quote, gluing, unquote, the uh, sand to the slide. I just, like I said, the camera just, did, just doesn't do it justice. Uh, and the reason I know that is because I can look through this binocular lens here and this really looks beautiful and colorful, and the camera just can't pick this up. Now, I don't know, uh, this is a more expensive camera, uh, but it just doesn't seem to do it. So these are all pieces of quartz. Rocks don't reflect back like that. So the quartz is reflecting back because it has the different angles inside the quartz. So.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably not use the polarizing microscope here for a couple of weeks so that I can get it refined. I, I need to talk to uh, the uh, guys at Amscope. They have a very helpful customer support uh, and service office, and I'm sure that if I spend a little time with them, they'll give me the ability uh, kind of to uh, make better polarizing, polarized images. Uh, let's see. Have you checked any samples under a black light? I've noticed uh, some of the rocks really glow under black light. Yeah, uh, looking, it's actually ultraviolet. Uh, Mark is referring to ultraviolet light. It is not unusual for rock hounds to uh, look at rocks uh, to that will fluoresce under a black light. Um, there are some rocks that are just naturally naturally fluorescent, and they fluoresce in different colors. You can filter them, and you can actually buy microscopes that are fluorescent. Uh, microscope, so they can do that for you. Uh, I do have a black light, and I will shine it upon rocks if I look want to see something interesting. The most obvious one is uh, calcite. It's a white quartzy looking thing, but when you uh, flash ultraviolet on it, it co it colors orange. It comes back uh, orange. I've never done that. I've never done that with sand. I'm not sure. I guess I'm going to have to now, Mark. Now that you mention it, uh, because again, you're dealing with sand grains. So you may not even be able to see anything that's fluorescing back just because it's so tiny. Uh, and to do it under a microscope, you have to have a fluorescent microscope, and that's a $1,500 microscope, which I can't quite afford just yet. But maybe one day, huh? All right. Uh, yeah, so for those of you that think I found a diamond in there, it's not a diamond, it's quartz. And it's the size of a grain of sand. All right. So let me see. I think I've got all the uh, questions answered. So I hope you like the sample. I hope you like the introduction to uh, pocket field notes. If you're a person who goes out in the field for literally any reason and you need to document what you're doing out in the field, whether it's, like I said, searching for a treasure or collecting a sand sample, uh, please take a look at the uh, product. I, I don't make any money from it. I just feel like uh, Mike, uh, Mark, uh, Mike did this as a favor to me. Um, you know, and and uh, and I want to help him uh, help reimburse uh, the investment in time and money uh, that he's put into refining this project because he's done literally done everything uh, that I've requested, and uh, and this is kind of my way of uh, my way of uh, giving back to him. So he was very kind to do that. All right, guys, uh, thanks for joining me today. Let me get the uh, old music up. So uh, thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this sample from Arroyo de las, de las Barrancas in near uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Uh, and uh, the reason I wanted to show you this sample, it was not only to familiarize you with pocket field notes, but to, uh, you know, make you aware that you don't have to drive across country to get yourself a great sample of sand. I'm willing to bet there is a great sand sample within uh, 10 minutes of where you live right now. Uh, unless I guess you're in New York City. No, I'll bet you could find them in New York City. Uh, I'll bet you there's a good sand sample within 10 minutes of where you live right now that you can send to us. We can look under the microscope and then you can share that video with your family and friends so that we can grow the channel. All right, thanks for joining me today. I hope, uh, I hope to see you again next week on both Wednesday at 3 p.m. and Friday at 3 p.m. Uh, do, I do have a couple of samples, several samples actually, from viewers who have sent us samples and I'm working through them in an orderly fashion. I think next week we've got, um, we've got Violet Mercury sample from Lake Chelan or Cilan. Uh, and then after that, I have the two samples that my daughter sent from uh, Spain and France. So we'll do that. Thanks for joining me today. You guys have a good uh, Friday afternoon. We'll see you tonight. Uh, there is no softer side uh, tonight, but we will see you at 7 o'clock for AGK.